Motivation chapter 8. What drives us? What makes us do what we do? Ugh, come on, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> self enhancement is a motivation to view oneself positively. And of course, we all try to do that. We like to see ourselves. Something interesting happened to me today. I just discovered I've held a, a track record uh, at my college for uh, 54 years, and uh, I found out that they tied it uh, this year. So I no longer am the sole, sole holder of that record. Uh, that, that self enhancement. That's, I was very proud of that. The fact and the fact that they couldn't break it, but now they have tied it, tied it. So. I no longer stand alone, I guess. Research reveals that people apparently have a strong need to view themselves in a positive light, and of course that made me see myself in a positive light. Self-esteem is a positivity of our overall evaluation of ourselves. In a study done in Canada in 1999, Heine, who is the author of your book, and his colleagues found that 93% of European Canadians had self-esteem scores that were above the midpoint of the scale self-serving biases, are tendencies for people to exaggerate how good they think they are. And, of course, this guy really looks like this, and when he see, looks in the mirror, he looks like that. So, a downward social comparison is when we compare ourselves to someone who is worse off than, we, than us. We are seeking to form a favorable comparison that casts our own performance in a positive light. When a setback occurs, the individual can focus on and perhaps exaggerate how good they are at something unrelated to their setback, compensating for the pain of failure. They can self-enhance by recruiting other kinds of positive thoughts. Like, yeah, well, maybe I just flunked psychology, but I can do a Rubik's Cube uh, one-handed uh, while doing a one-arm push-up in two minutes and 14 seconds. This counting is uh, reducing the perceived importance of the domain in which an individual performed badly. People might attribute cause of their actions to something outside themselves, external attribution, in contr contrast to an internal attribution where they see the causes within themselves. Uh, I flunked psychology not because uh, because I uh, didn't study. It wasn't my fault. It was Bradway's fault. He asked the wrong questions. Some people dissipate their personal failures by basking in the reflected glory of a successful group they identify with, like the Blue Eagles. I'm not sure what. I think that's... I think that's... Um, uh, Boise State. Research seems to show that European Americans, even at a young age, tend to maintain fairly high self-enhancement motivations. Trump and Wright, uh, Trump and Wright, I'm sorry, in 2003 found that the pre that preschool and elementary school European American children chose self-enhancing images at 92% uh, compared to a similar group of Mexican-American students at 82%. So European-Americans uh, see themselves more positively than Mexican-American students. When Freiburg and Marcus looked at, in 2003, looked at a group of elementary school Native Americans, they found that less than half made positive statements about themselves. The authors saw these uh, results as consistent with the understanding the Native Americans are less independent, and uh, independence is related to self-enhancement. They did not prove uh, that did, this did not prove, bleh, prove true of the collectivistic uh, Maori of uh, of New Zealand. This did not prove true of African Americans, according to Major Spencer Schmatter, Wolf and Crocker in 1998. This did not prove true of the Israeli Druze uh, uh, by Kerman in 2001. And you may ask yourself, well, who are the Israeli Druze? What in the world is a Druze? 
Druze are kind of a, a cross, they're a, a religious group uh, that uh, is kind of between the Jewish faith and the, the Muslim faith, the Druze. And as, as of course, uh, both groups dislike them. Is the uh, Jewish people don't like them because they're not they uh, they're too much like uh, Muslims, and Muslims don't like them because they're too much like Jews. As bizarre as that may seem, <clears throat> this did not prove true of Asian Indians, uh, according to Joshi and Carter in 2013. 93% of European Canadians have high self-esteem. There's a shock for you. And that's according to Heine, your author, in 1999. Heine et al. 55% of Japanese Canadians have high self-esteem. That's according to Heine et al. in 1999. Remember, Heine is uh, married to a Japanese woman. Masses of research show that Americans find success more memorable, probably because they think more about them. And Japanese tend to find failures more memorable because they think more about them. And this is according to Hamamura and Heine in 20, 2007. Kitayama and Matsumoto and, oh, Kitayama, Matsumoto and uh, Norasakunit in 1997. After failing at a task, North Americans tend to discount the importance of the task. Japanese will view the task as even more important. Americans tend to bask in the reflected glory of their sports teams, while the Japanese are more likely to be critical of the local team as the opposition. Heine and others have speculated that East Asians are just as motivated as Westerners to evaluate themselves positively merely uh, as their group selves instead okay. of their individual selves. East Asians like themselves as much as Westerners, but seem to be more self-critical of their competence. One of the phenomena of Craigslist and eBay is the endowment effect. Westerners tend to value something more uh, after they own it, uh, which makes them inflate the prices they are asking for their junk. We see the opposite uh, effect in e with East Asians. They lower the price of their junk. Miller and her colleagues in 1997, then again in 2002, looked at children's stories in the United States and Taiwan. They found a marked difference. American stories focused the children's attention on their strengths, while Taiwanese stories focused on areas that needed correcting. A European-American parents viewed self-esteem as central to child rearing. Taiwanese parents expressed the belief that too much self-esteem can lead to frustration when things aren't working out well for the children. <clears throat> Research shows that the notion of individual selves didn't emerge in Western literature until the 12th century. At this point, the Christian concept of the Last Judgment changed from being an issue of the salvation of collectives to the salvation of individual souls. With the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, many Protestant sects maintained a belief in pre predestination or the idea that once fate was determined before birth. This gave people a great drive to enhance themselves as they proved that they were one of God's chosen people. Face is a strong Eastern idea that barely registers among Westerners. Face has been defined as the amount of social value others give you if you live up to the standards associated with your position. The higher your social position, the greater the amount of face available to you. If others grant you face, you'll enjoy all the per, uh, perquisites that uh, come with the enhanced powers and uh, status and powers. Uh, one characteristic of face is that it's more easily lost than gained. The amount of face an individual has access to is determined by position. Thus, increasing face can only be increased with promotion. 
While face is difficult to enhance, face is lost whenever individuals fail to live up to the standards of their roles. Face is always vulnerable, and because others determine a person's face, people must count on the goodwill of others to be able to maintain their face. Since face is so easily lost, uh, one strategy is for people to adopt a cautious approach and try to ensure that they are not acting in a way that might lead others to reject them. This approach is known as prevention orientation, being defensive and cautious. Prevention orientation is contrasted with promotion orientation, where the individual is more concerned with advancing themselves and aspiring for gains. Prevention seeks to avoid bad things, while promotion seeks to secure good things. Canadian and Japanese participants were given a faux test that they all failed. They were given a chance to either work on their problems or focus on their successes in the test. Canadian participants chose to focus on things they did well, promotion focus. In the same study, the Japanese participants maintained a more prevention focus. They were more interested in working on things they did, poor, did poorly, apparently so that they could improve themselves and be less likely to fail in the future. This self-improvement motivation, a desire to seek out potential weaknesses and work on correcting them, is str uh, strong medic uh, motivation in East Asian contexts. Eastern and Western cultures deal with strengths and weaknesses differently. East Asian parents are more likely to call their children's attention to their weaknesses. Western parents direct their children's attention to their strengths. As East Asians have increased their fortunes, they have become big consumers of brand name luxury goods. Pur purchasing and displaying brand name goods can in uh, increase face. A key motivation for these acquisitions is to achieve social recognition. In 1904-1905, Max Weber, who was a sociologist, printed a controversial but uh, influential series of essays entitled The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Weber uh, attempted to determine how capitalism was able to emerge from the traditional economics of medieval Europe. Before Weber, the prime social idea came from Karl Marx. Marx felt that capitalism was a result of surplus capital that came from the shift from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. Marx also felt that religion was being used by governments to control the people. Weber viewed capitalism as the product of people's der deriving meaning from a particular cultural context. Capitalism grew out of a belief system that was rooted in a number of cultural ideas that began emerging in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe and in North America. The ideas that became the foundation for capitalism were ones that grew out of the Protestant Reformation. Protestants emphasized literacy training more than Catholics, so that people would be able to read the Bible for themselves. The individualized relation that formed between each person and God has been argued to be central to the blossoming of individualism that emerged during the Reformation and continues to influence much of Western society today. Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, proposed that each individual had a calling, that is, a unique God-given purpose to fulfill during his or her mortal existence. The idea was that we are all God's servants in the world and that we are each given a specific duty or job to take care of, uh, which, uh, of uh, to take care of while we tend the planet. Got it. God gives each individual the unique skills and capabilities needed to fulfill their calling, and it is incumbent upon individuals to discover their calling. The highest moral duty that individuals were believed to have was to serve God well by working hard at their calling. Luther was able to imbue daily labor with a spiritual significance that had traditionally been reserved for religious activities such as prayer 
and ritual. Because Protestants came to view work as a spiritual task, they wished to avoid debasing it by holding a, ca a casual or unprofessional attitude. Protestants felt that people should take their work very seriously. <clears throat> it was believed that God would not reward those who were doomed to burn in hell. So any sign of material success was perceived as evidence that one was one of the elect. Any accumulated wealth was to be reinvested to further one's efforts and to accumulate even more wealth and evidence of one's status among the elect. Modern capitalism, as Weber viewed it, was thus concerned with the accumulation of wealth for its own sake and not for the sake of material pleasures it brought. So you're trying to show that uh, God favors you. A recent analysis found that Protestants and people living in Protestant societies more generally consider the prospect of being unemployed as more of a blow to their well-being than non-Protestants living in non-Protestant societies do. This is according to Van Hoom and Maysland in 2013. In the early 21st century, a study revealed that Protestant nations were far more industrialized than their Catholic counterparts, and religious differences accounted for much of that. And that's according to Cavalcante and Parente and Zhao in 2007. A degree of individualism exists in Protestant countries compared to other countries. The six most individualistic countries in the world are largely Protestant, whereas the least individualistic Western societies are largely Catholic. And there you go. <clears throat> Countries dominated by various Asian religions also tend to score low in individualism. Pronounced differences in embracing an intrinsic work ethic were observed between West, Western European Catholics and mainstream Protestants as evident in a measure of work values, and that's according to Georgie and Marsh in 1990. The Protestant ethic has been associated with negative attitudes toward laziness and being overweight. This is according to Quinn and Crocker in 1999. McClelland in 1961 found that Protestant parents expected their children to become self-reliant at an earlier age, compared with Catholic parents. McClelland in 1961 investigated the stories written by young boys and found that those written by German Protestants had more evidence of strong achievement motivations than those written by German Catholics. Now, this is really kind of an interesting picture because uh, many of the t cities and towns in, in Germany were destroyed during World War II. So they had to rebuild the cities. And when they did, um, the, the uh, uh, churches uh, that existed in Germany um, were became state uh, controlled because, well, they didn't become state controlled. The the uh, state rebuilt the churches. Uh, so what they did, <laughs> what they did, they have the Lutheran Church primarily, which is a Protestant uh, religion, and then they have the Catholic Church. So in every town, you'll see a Catholic Church and a Protestant Church. Now, normally the Protestant Church is at one end of the town, and the Catholic Church is at the other end of the town. This is a Catholic church that uh, was not destroyed, but this is a rebuilt uh, uh, Protestant church. Of course, they just call them Protestants, but they're almost all Lutheran churches. And you can tell, always tell the Lutheran church or the Protestant church because it has a high steeple. Now, this is a Catholic church right here. That's kind of funny. Anyway, not important. Well, maybe it is to the Germans anyway. <clears throat> Ullman and Tannenbaum and Barr in 2011 primed a group of Americans and a group of Canadians with salvation words or neutral words and then gave them a task to do. Americans who were primed with salvation words worked harder on their task than those who were primed with neutral words. Now this is a picture of the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was being punished for something. I can't remember what he did. 
He gave humans something. Anyway, he was uh, condemned to roll a boulder up a hill. And as soon as he got it to the top, it would roll back down. So he'd have to go to the bottom of the hill and roll it back up. And that was his punishment. The myth of Sisyphus uh, is to roll it up. Roll the, roll the boulder up the, up the hill. And as soon as he gets to the top, it, it rolls right back down. The American results indicate the, that notions of hard work and salvation are implicitly linked for Americans. This pattern occurred regardless of whether or not the American participants were religious, providing some evidence for Weber's claim that ideas about predestination become secularized and thus part of the American cultural fabric. And this was one of the worries um, uh, dealing with the immigrants in the early part of the 20th century. The idea was that we've got all these Catholics coming in to the United States from southern Italy or from southern uh, Europe and eastern Europe. Almost everybody coming in were Catholics. And they were, they were afraid it would change the dynamic uh, of, the, um, uh, uh, of, of the American culture. Uh, so what they did, they, uh, they wrote all of this uh, Protestant, well, not really Protestantism, but this, uh, this work ethic uh, into the educational system uh, so that they could educate the, uh, or indoctrinate or assimilate or force to assimilate uh, the uh, Catholic uh, kids that were coming into the United States from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. It was part of the education system. They wanted to make them good workers. Canadian participants did not work any harder when primed with ideas about salvation, suggesting that an implicit link between salvation and working was not evident. Of course, salvation was uh, evident, um, or the uh, uh, it, it was evident as far as the Americans were concerned. Canadians didn't buy into it. Cohen, Kim, and Hudson induced male uh, American Protestant Jews and Catholics to imagine their sisters in sexual situations, then had them do sculptures. Uh, so what they had them do, they told them a story about their own sisters, and they talked about uh, their six, catching their sisters in a sexual situation. The Protestants were judged as working harder on their sculptures than the Jews or the Catholics, or the Protestants not primed with depravity about their sisters. The researchers concluded that it was the depraved thoughts that induced the Protestants to work harder. As weird as that sounds, what, what, a, what strange research people are doing. <laughs> they, so they took Protestants, Jews, and Catholics, and they told them, they told them a nasty story about their own sisters, and then they had them do sculptures. And the Protestants worked harder trying to, trying to get rid of that thought out of their heads. They're trying to work that thought right out of their heads. We can see the world is fixed and beyond our control to change, the entity theory of the world. Or we can think of the world as flexible and responsive to our efforts to change it, an incremental theory of the world. Roth. Rothbaum, Weiss, and, and Snyder in 1982 proposed that there were two ways to gain control of your life. People achieve a sense of primary control by striving to, to shape existing realities to fit their perceptions, goals, or wishes. Primary control also goes uh, under the related name internal locus of control, influence, and agency. Internal locus of control. I control my own fate. People achieve a sense of secondary control when they attempt to align themselves with existing realities, leaving the realities unchanged but exerting control over the psychological impact of these realities. So they're buying into uh, different stories, and the stories that they want to read are the ones that agree with them. Why do they do that? In order to uh, change the, uh, the control. The idea is, now I have control over things. Why? Because I'm only listening to stories that agree with me. So this gives me more control. Uh, and I will create the illusion in my own mind 
then I actually have control because the only stories I listen to are the ones that agree with me. Secondary control, also known as adjustment, is related to the construct of external locus of control. Your desires and goals adjust themselves to what your environment is most likely to provide. So as far as the external locus of control, <clears throat> uh, you, you adjust your own thoughts to what, whatever's going on. Weiss, uh, Rothbaum, and Blackburn in 1984 see many socializing experiences in Japan that lead Japanese to be more comfortable with engaging in secondary control strategies. Japanese infants spend much more time in contact with their mothers and thus learn to adjust themselves to what their mothers are doing. Japanese workers change jobs far less frequently than their Western counterparts, and it is not uncommon for workers to be promised lifetime employment, a system ensuring that employees learn to adjust themselves to whatever demands the company places on them. In a Japanese and American study where workers were asked to recount when they had been helped and when they had helped others, the Americans were better able to recall when they had influenced others. And this is according to Morley, Kitayama, and uh, Miyamoto in 2002. The Japanese recalled far more times when they were assisted than when they helped uh, someone else. There's a little emphasis on making choices in life for people from India. Making choices seems to be more difficult uh, for Indians than for Americans. Indians take significantly more time to make choices than do Americans. And this is according to research by Savani, Marcus, and Connor in 2008. Asian Indians don't respond as negatively when they are deprived of the opportunity to choose when compared with Americans. Asian Indians and people from numerous other non-Western cultures also indicate that they have less free uh, choice in their lives compared with North Americans. Choices do not appear to play as large a part in the live, lives of Asian Indians as North Americans. So we want to choose because we're Americans. The more important the action, the more likely Americans were to identify it as a personal choice. Whereas the Asian Indians, the more important the action, the less likely they were to view it as a personal choice. Uh, now, what's the difference? The difference is that Americans... Uh, want to take credit for uh, their successes. As far as in Asian Indians are concerned, if it didn't work out, they don't want to blame themselves for it. When Americans are given an opportunity to choose something, they almost always select the option they prefer. The link between preferences and choices isn't as tight among Asian Indians. They are less likely to choose their favorite option because as far as they're concerned, it doesn't really matter because normally they don't get a choice. So usually uh, um, their preferred uh, choice uh, doesn't exist. In learned helplessness, an individual feels that he or she is unable to control or avoid unpleasant events, and the person will suffer from stress and potentially depression. A study by Oding, Odingen and, and Seligman in 1990 found that East Berliners showed more signs of learned helplessness than the people on the other side of the wall in West Berlin. Why, why did they feel that way? Yeah, because they had fair, very few choices. So they had to accept whatever they had, whatever they were given. Snibby and Marcus in 2005 argue that upper-middle-class Americans are raised to favor choices and to express themselves through their choices. They learn to respond quite negatively when they believe that they do not have any choice in a situation. Working-class Americans grew up learning that much of what people encounter in life is beyond their control because they work someplace where people are always telling them what to do. They, don't have, uh, they have very few choices in life. <clears throat> a good, and they feel that a good way to maintain one's independence is to emphasize one's integrity and resilience during tough times. 
because normally they don't have choices. But Ash's work in 1962 showed that Americans were likely to conform to social pressure than not. 75% of Ash's American subjects conformed on at least one of the 12 trials. Conformity is common. And if you remember the Ash experiment, they had a room full of Confederates uh, and one person that they were, that they were um, uh, testing. So what they would do, um, they would go along and they would make the wrong choice to see if the individual would conform, just the one individual. So if they had a room full of people or four or five people and they all agreed on an answer, it was hard for the uh, subject uh, not to agree with them, even though it was fairly obvious that they were wrong. Ash conducted other experiments dealing with conformity and found that there are several consequences to not conforming. People might laugh at you, and nobody wants to be laughed at. People tend to actively dislike those who, who won't conform. A meta-analysis of conformity studies shows that while Americans show a great deal of conformity, people with collectivistic cultures conform even more especially when they are conforming to their in-groups. And this is according to Bond and Smith in 1996. And of course, this is a picture of a military unit that is exercising. And that is the end of the chapter. So next week, we'll tackle chapter number nine, I think.